Okay, um, good afternoon everyone. So today um, I'm going to talk about two topics. I'm going to talk about making changes towards a, a healthy lifestyle. And also I'm going to talk about taking charge of your health. So the topics that I'm going to talk about is very far away from the hospital. I'm going to take you away from patient care and all that, all right? Um, the last part, right? Leading an active life is something that I hope that will happen when you actually leave this auditorium. Okay. So as a geriatrician, right, I cannot run away from talking about aging. Um, the maximum lifespan of a human life at the moment is about 120 years. So there are people actually who actually believe that you can extend this human lifespan to beyond 120. So scientists and uh, entrepreneurs have actually put $1 million into research, into looking at how they can extend human life beyond this. But we all know, right, uh, it's not about the years, all right? It's about the health span, the years that you, li you, uh, that you live a healthy, uh, a healthy life. So that comes to the next topic, which is successful aging. What is the definition of successful aging and who should actually define it? Okay, Dr. Rowe and Kant uh, proposed this model uh, from their study uh, among successful ages in the McMaster's uh, study. So maintaining health and physical function, avoidance of disease and engagement in life, are the key ingredients that they feel that would lead you to successful aging. But we know that uh, you cannot always avoid disease, right? That's not always possible. So when you ask seniors, what do they understand by successful aging? What does it mean to them? So other elements start to come out when you ask them. Things like enjoyment, a positive outlook, having a purpose in life, productivity, as well as, as life uh, satisfaction. So the model of successful aging is starting to look very different, right? It's starting to look a bit more diverse. Things look a little bit more rich. So it includes not just the medical aspects of, or the social aspects, but also the psychological aspects. So in 2010, uh, Annette Nielsen from Coltrum, John Copping, Sweden, came down to Singapore and shared with us her Passion for Life program. So this was, this was a novel approach towards uh, the message of successful aging. So the objective of this program was actually to spread the message of the elderly taking charge of their own life, taking responsibility for preventive care, so that they can achieve a rich and healthy life as possible. And it was also to find messengers among them who can actually communicate this knowledge as well as spread these ideas. So we actually adapt these ideas and develop our own program called Engage in Life. So all of us know what healthy aging is all about. If I ask all of you, how many actually practice healthy lifestyle here? How many actually practice it consistently? All right. So if somebody comes up to you today and asks you, if I ask you, how do you rate your health today on a scale of 1 to 10? How many of you will say 10? <laughs> oh. So it is all about what you feel that you can actually uh, attain, all right? What you can do some more to actually make your health be better. So it's well, what you want your health to be like in the future. So this program aims to actually bridge that gap from having that knowledge into translating it into action so that you can make that change to reach your future of health that you want. Okay, through six sessions of meetings, which we call cafes, our participants learn how to make changes in their life in a supportive environment. The participants learn 
how to use the plan, do, check, and act cycle to make these changes. So each week, they receive information from a expert speaker, and from there, they were encouraged to actually make changes or make plans on how they want to make the changes. The following week, they come back, all right? They check back on how they have done, and then they share. They share their success and their problems. And through discussion and brainstorming, they come up with their own solutions on how they can overcome these problems. So the program actually covers uh, four topics uh, related to healthy lifestyle, safety in the home and outside the home, um, exercise, diet, as well as social networking. So in all these teams, there will be an expert speaker that help the coach the participants in making that change and making that plans. So in order to keep, keep them on continuing towards the change that they've already made, right, to prevent them from slipping backwards, newsletters are sent to them before their next cafe meeting to remind them of what was discussed in the previous cafe so that they can keep up the good work. And through these six weeks, the facilitators as well as the expert help them to continue on their journey towards making that change. So in the last cafe, they will actually recap whatever they have learned, all right? And they celebrate their success with makan, of course, and it's all healthy food here, okay? So I'd like to share you this poem, which is written by one of our uh, Engage in Life facilitator, all right? This was actually published in Mind Your, Language, uh, Mind Your Body in 2014. So maybe I share a little bit about the story of uh, the lady who wrote the poetry. All right. She had developed chronic disease at the age of 57. And the most distressing part of her disease was the arthritis of the knee that she had. So she had a lot of pain and difficulty walking. And without knowing, right, uh, she tend to be spending a lot of time at home and less and less outside the home. So she decided to join our program. So after the, she joined our program, she managed to make changes in her life. And then she became one of our messenger to spread this information. So Audrey's story about chronic disease is not unique. I'm sure if I ask a show of hands, a lot of you here will say I do also have, right? Okay. So, all over the world, the number of people who has chronic disease is on the rise, and the chronic disease is plaguing our society. All right. In Singapore, one in four people has got hypertension, one in six got high cholesterol, and one in ten has got diabetes. And in 2050, we will have one million people with diabetes. So if you don't know, there's a war on diabetes going on right now. Okay. <clears throat> the difference between acute illness and chronic disease is that it's not something that you have today and it is gone tomorrow. It will continue to plague you for 24 hours a day, I mean 24 hours in a day and 365 days of the year. So it's estimated that about 20% of an average person's lifespan is spent being chronically ill. So if you imagine someone with 80 years old of lifespan, 16 years is actually spent suffering from chronic disease. And the common experience in chronic disease is one of physical limitation, loss of function, and uncertainty. So one of our other programs is the Sanford University Chronic Disease Self-Management Program. This program has been helping people all around the world to cope with their illness and the changes that comes with chronic disease. Through this program, they actually understand their role in this illness. They understand how to make informed decisions and they start to engage in healthy behaviors. They learn to put the disease in the background and to continue to live a normal life. 
This program is also evidence-based. It's been researched and has shown that people who go on the program have better control of their, um, their diseases and also they visit their doctor less often. The program is about self-management, so it's not focused on any particular chronic illness. It applies to any chronic disease. So what is self-management all about? What are the components? So some of the common components are um, learning how to set goals, learning how to make action plans that are specific and realistic, and learning how to track your progress. Sometimes in, when you have chronic illness, you need to make decisions. So you are taught how to weigh the pros and the cons. Sometimes in chronic illness, you need to solve problems. So you are taught how to do brainstorming, how to test your solutions, and how to move on. So this is an example, right, of how you set goals and do action plans. So you choose a goal that is important to you, right? Don't choose goals that are not important. So why bother to do it, right? So something like exercise. Then you make your action plans. You have to be very specific of how you want to carry it out like how you want to do, or what is the exercise that you want to carry out, how often do you want to do it, or when do you want to do it, and then after that, you think about what are the things that can probably prevent you from carrying out this activity, and think about the solutions that you can come up to actually overcome these problems. And then you rate your ability to actually carry out this on a scale of, um, 0 to 10, from 0 being less confident and 10 is very confident. And then you rate, if your confidence is very low, then you have to think again, um, should I carry it out this way? Should I change it? Oh, I see I've only got one minute left. Okay, uh, I don't think I can speak that fast. But anyway, um, at the end, you also need to put a timeline, right? You need to put a time when you want to actually review whether you're successful or not. This is important because if you put it forever, right, then you, know, you just carry on without knowing whether you are successful or not. Being successful is important because it keeps your confidence up. Okay, other than um, talking about uh, action planning, a lot of people with chronic disease uh, has a lot of emotional problems because the stress of the illness, uh, the stress of accommodating to a new role, the stress of changing their behaviour results in a lot of emotions. And a lot of the emotions are grief, anger, fear and frustrations. But this emotion does not only occur in the people who are suffering, but also the caregivers. So this program also opens up to caregivers of people with chronic disease. So emotions actually prevent you from doing your self-management properly. So they are also taught how to manage their emotions. Besides emotion, there's also negative thinking. It's things like blaming yourself, right? Jumping to conclusions, you know? Making negative things. Uh, whatever you say is always a negative. Right? So they are taught on how to counteract all this. They are also taught how to talk to their healthcare givers, right? Okay, so a lot of us have been patient before. So when we see the doctor, it's always the doctor talking, right? They always tell you what to do. They tell you you need to do this test, you need to take this medicine. And after that, they tell you, okay, you come back to see me in three months' time. Okay, as a doctor myself, I have been guilty of that, right? We do not get the patients to actually participate in that decision-making. And this, I think, is a flaw because there's a risk that the patients will not comply and whatever your outcomes you want to achieve will fail. So what do we do? We empower the patient, right? We tell them... Before you go and see the doctor, you must prepare yourself. Bring all the questions that you want to ask the doctor. Bring all your tests that you have done, all the monitoring that you did at home, your BP, your blood sugar level, right? Have an agenda. What is it that you want out of this consultation? Make the money worth your while, right? Okay. 
But it doesn't work one way, right? The doctor or the healthcare person needs to also do the right thing, right? They need to write, ask the right questions. They need to help the patients to set the goals and then support their actions, right? So it has been shown that this collaborative self-management actually helps the patient to be an active manager in their own health and also it keeps them going when the challenges get more challenging. Okay, so this is an example that I've picked out on how you can actually prepare yourself before you go and see a doctor. Okay, one's belief in your ability to succeed is also very important in self-management. So how do we achieve and build your confidence? You actually try to break down your goals into smaller goals that you can achieve. So once you have successes, you build on your successes. This will build your confidence to make that self-management a real uh, goal to your outcomes. Okay. Before I go on, I want to talk a little bit about uh, volunteerism. Okay. I know a lot of you are already volunteering. I just want to share a story about one of our CDSMP facilitator, uh, Siu Hong. She has been doing volunteer work all of her life, from her youth. So in 1990, she developed a chronic disease. She decided to take up our CDSMP, or Chronic Disease Self-Management Program. And through to form, right, after she went through this course, she decided to be a volunteer facilitator because she believes in giving back. So she feels that talking about and teaching self-management actually helps her to solve her own problem. So if you're not still convinced that helping others is good, there are actually hard evidence to show that um, helping others is good for your health. You've heard about the runner's high, right? Where people who run regularly get addicted to running because their brain releases all these good feel hormones, right? So it's the same thing also occurs in people who help other people. They get this helper's high. So this helpers high help the protect them against stressful events and increase longevity. And then the other hormones that is also released when you help other people is oxytocin, which is a the love hormone, right? It leads to better health, better wound healing, and also helps to sleep better. So you can forget about your Prozac and your sleeping tablet. Just go and help other people. I'm not sure whether I have time to show you a video, all right? Uh, I'd like to show a video of uh, our Stepping in Out into Active Life program. This is a program to help elderly prevent falls and remain active in the community. So the basis of it is exercise, which is the focus of uh, the program. They do uh, balance and strength training. So usually it's done uh, in near their house at the senior activity centers. I think the sound is not okay. So they use terabands, okay. So they do this twice a week, uh, twice a week, an hour each session, right? So after a while, they got very bored with the exercise. We introduced some dancing. So this dancing is also to train their balance because by stepping and turning direction, it helps to their balance. And by remembering the steps, it also helps with their memory and cognition. Okay, so we add some nice music also to keep them interested. Okay, more dancing. So the ladies enjoy it more than the guys. <laughs> so you can see a lot of ladies uh, in the program. Okay. So we also included some uh, funky moves. <laughs> Okay, this, is, this looks simple, right? But actually what they're doing is that they're balancing, they're standing with their legs, one in front of the other. Okay, if you have poor balance, please don't try this at home, okay?
Okay, this is an interview, okay? It's not scripted, okay? This is all from her. Okay, our ex-participants and our partners. Okay, I just like to leave you with this quote from Socrates: "Not life, but a good life is to be chiefly valued." Thank you very much. Thank you, Dr. Hafiza. Do we have any questions for Dr. Hafiza? No, you were mentioning they do twice a week, one hour each time. Yes, yes. I think many of us don't even rack up those timing twice a week, one hour each time. We need to join. But we've got a question from right in front. Good evening to all of you. I'm Madam Tan. Just now you said take off the line. The one of the participants. Which I question? Agree. Because Yishun, I think it's Kute Pak. Kute Pak panelist here. Yes. There's one uh, participant. Earlier question. To talk about the plant, about the food. Yes. Uh, the plant are bigger, all this. Yes, it's very true. I agree with her, you know. Because uh, the food in, in Singapore, you have to get a, a take with a pinch of salt. You know, even, I, I, I think they have colour, you know. Because uh, once they into your cloth, uh, in, into your clothes, uh, you use soap you can't to wash, wash it off. Uh, cannot wash it up. So what kind of colouring did they put? No, uh, I think there's... And, 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 and you say, take off the light. I think you shouldn't say, take off the light. Let, let, let her continue and let the panellists answer her question. If they couldn't, they are doctors. They are not the... Uh, I don't know what, what, what profession in this thing. Agree. Anyway, you should uh, take up with the authorities. The Anti-Veterinary Association, a AVA. AVA? Yeah, you, sh you, sh you should even... Uh, uh, today, this thing should be broadcast in all social media and let the authorities see to it and take action. Otherwise, I tell you that all of us will have a lot of diseases. You look at so many diseases now, there are all kinds of diseases, even if we keep ourselves healthy. Understand. And obviously, you're very passionate about this topic. And I think it is true. It's something that we should be concerned about because food is something we consume into our body daily, right? And yes. it affects our system, of course. I think what the topic is today is not addressing in particular that topic. Perhaps it could be something we could discuss in our next year's conference, one of the topics. Something this that year. we could highlight. Uh, this year already, every hospital is so packed with all those all, all those patients many people are sick and sick so next year will be even more you know i think i, I, I think wish hospital also cannot accommodate <laughs> i wish i had the answer for you but i really do not have the answer yeah i know for you. but you shouldn't say take off the line you should continue okay let the panelists answer all right uh, or the uh, doctors pull together and petition to the government all right. ask the government to look it because uh, this this, this panelist should be doing in the morning when Dr. Amy Koh is here because she's a senior minister of state for health. She's the best person to look into this issue. All right. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you for your comments. Do we have any questions for Dr. Hafiza? If there isn't, uh, I would like to thank you. Thank you. Thank you for your sharing. Thank you.